Hi class, so today we are going to be talking about a new empire. So we just got done talking about the Greeks, about their civilization, their traditions, about, you know, the polis, the different city-states, their empire under Alexander the Great, and the spread of Hellenistic culture. And today we're going to be taking a look at the foundations of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, I dare say, is one of the most powerful empires in history. Their beliefs, their culture, their language, even their architecture, their monuments, uh, many of them still stand today. And we are going to be talking about the foundation of the Roman Empire. And that's going to be the Roman Republic. Because before Rome was an empire, it was a republic. And it had a representative government. So we're going to learn a little bit more about the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic. I should say that our essential questions for today... Um, I should let you know what those are. So uh, these are the things that we're going to answer by the end of this lesson. So why do cultures change? We're going to look at that because we're going to be seeing in the early years of Rome, there are, there are a lot of changes, but particularly in the political arena, you know, how do kingdoms expand? And we're going to see, we're going to answer that question. We're going to look through the expansion of Rome itself, not only with their its territory, but its influence. And, you know, how does that happen? And also how our governments, uh, you know, are established, maintained, and changed. Because we're going to see a lot of that changing within Rome. So let's get started. So first, um, first we have, uh, let's talk about the city of Rome itself. So Rome is today the capital of Italy. It's been around for thousands of years now. And there's a myth about its origins, about these two children who were raised by wolves who were supposedly sons of gods who chose this spot where Rome is to build Rome. And we do know that, no, you know, this, it's really just a myth. We don't really have anything to back it up. But we do know that the first settlers of Rome chose it because of its fertile soil. Uh, you could grow crops there, and it's a strategic location because it's on the Italian peninsula. It's on the Tiber River, uh, and you can access the Mediterranean Sea uh, and it's also built on hills, which gives it a defensive fortification. So again, we're looking at, you know, the beginnings of civilization. We talked about that at the beginning of this class. And Rome hits all those markers of a civilization. It's built on a river, so it has, and also has some natural boundaries, good farmland, access to waterways. So you can see why it uh, had the potential for being a great civilization. Now, the first Romans were the Latins. And the Latins, Greeks, and the Etruscans were a group of people on the uh, Italian peninsula. They were confined over there in this particular area. And they fought over control over this region, right, because of its good strategic location. And originally, the Latins were here at Rome from 1000 BCE before Common Era to 500 BCE. Now, eventually a different group is going to move into this area that um, they occupied and take over and control the Latin peoples that were previously in Rome. And that's going to be the Etruscans. But uh, the Etruscans are also going to you know, influence the Latins in this area with their architecture, their writings. And um, we'll see, we'll talk a little bit more right now about the Etruscans. So the, again, the Etruscans, they come in again about 600 BCE, and they're really the ones who catapult Rome from a bunch of villages to an urban center. Uh, they built the first temples that are in Rome. They built the first uh, public uh, spaces, public centers. Uh, for instance, the Roman Forum, which is where the government was established and maintained and debated. And you can still it's a place you can still visit today. And it was built by the Etruscans. Now, eventually the Romans are going to overthrow the Etruscans and their king Tarquin in 509 BCE. So the Etruscans are around for about 100 years, and the Romans are going to found a republic. And they're going to create a government where its people elect representatives to make laws and govern over them. Uh, the picture you see here on the right is King Tarquin, uh, the proud and he was uh, one of the, the kings of the Etruscans. He 
was overthrown by the Romans, like I said. And after he was overthrown, uh, the Romans founded their republic. Now, uh, when they founded this republic, the Romans established uh, two different groups based on socioeconomic status. Basically, Rome uh, was made up, uh, its society was made up of two different groups. And the first group was the patricians, and the second was the plebeians. And the patricians, uh, you can see them on the picture on the left, these are the people who own large pieces of land. They were very wealthy. They gained their wealth probably through trade and through farm, uh, trading farmland and owning farmland, right? And um, they're going to hold most of the power in Rome because of the wealth that they possess. And then you have the plebeians. They were artisans, merchants, farmers, right? And even though they can uh, vote in something called the assembly, they can't really rule right? So they don't really have as much power as the patricians do. So, uh, and even though they, they yeah, they, they can't enforce laws, they can, they can't really rule, um, they can still vote for representatives and for their, and their government. Now there are also tribunes, and tribunes, they were representatives uh, for the, ple the plebeians, right? So they were voted for by the plebeians, and their goal was to protect them, to protect that class, the plebeian class, and to advise. Their job was to advise the patricians, the very wealthy, uh, to and to help try to keep the plebeians happy, right? Now, in 451 BCE, so about roughly 50 to 60 years after the Roman Republic was established, the plebeians they had had enough of the patricians and had enough of the oppression that they had to deal with because of the patricians. Uh, they previously didn't have any protection under the law. They could be abused. They could be treated unfairly. They could be stolen from. They really didn't have a whole lot of protection. So the plebeians forced the patricians to make laws to govern everyone. And these laws were carved onto 12 tablets, which are called the 12 tables. And this is going to be the foundation for laws that Rome will make later on in its history. And what these laws did was they gave all free citizens. Now, let me emphasize again what a free citizen is. We kind of touched upon this in our discussions over Greece, about Greece. Um, now, citizens, free citizens uh, under the law of, of laws of Rome... To become a free citizen, first of all, you had to be male, right? So unfortunately, women were not seen as citizens. Secondly, you had to be an adult. And third, you had to own land. Now, does that mean every male who was Roman had protection under the 12 tables? No, because owning land was fairly difficult, of course. Now, to guarantee these protections, the 12 tables... They were hung in the forum, that public space that we were talking about. They were hung in the forum in public view so people could see them. And this added a layer of accountability to the government. Because those protections were in a public place and uh, could be seen, uh, you're seeing that the common person was able to dictate how the government was run instead of just one person or a couple people dictating the direction of the kingdom. You're starting to see that the common people are able to influence, the common person is able to influence uh, government, which is really, really big when you think about it um, and what it, uh, what it means for uh, society and for uh, civilizations later on. So let's look at the government that the Roman Republic had. So the Roman Republic, first of all, Rome had, uh, let's actually back up. So the smallest aspect of Roman government were the assemblies. And as you all know, free citizens could vote in in, uh, in the assemblies. And these, uh, again, adult male landowners, citizens, could select tribunes to represent the, ple the plebeians and elect representatives to make laws for the common people. Now, 
what the group that made laws for the common people that that would be the senate i mean i'm sorry that was the assembly right now for besides the assembly you have the senate and they're the ones that are really going to be in charge of the domestic and foreign policies of rome and they're really the ones setting the tone for what rome is going to do and the roman senate consisted about of uh, all patricians, right? So they were from the Roman upper class. And there was about 300 members of the Senate. And at the top, we have two consuls. And these are people who are in power for uh, one year, one year terms. And one of the consuls is to lead the military, kind of like a military general. And the other is going to direct the government uh, and try to focus the assembly and the senate together and get them to work together. Now, um, in a time of crisis, in an emergency situation, the senate, which was run by the patricians, the upper class, could appoint a dictator, someone who could take control for six months to um, guide Rome through a major crisis, maybe something like a famine or a war. And the reason why the senate would do this is because to pass laws and enforce them, the Senate would take a long time because you had a lot of people with a lot of different opinions. I'm sure you've seen and heard about, uh, you know, our own government, how long it takes for us to get laws passed. Uh, it's not any different uh, how it was back then. It was the same way. Trying to get that many people with different opinions to agree on something's difficult. And, they're, you know, they had to, to compromise and talk, and it would just take a long time. And... Uh, in order to address the crisis immediately and to get things done immediately and quickly, uh, they inst implemented a dictator. They installed a dictator who would do that. But this dictator could only be in power for six months. And what we're going to see later is one of these dictators is going to declare himself dictator for life. But we're going to find that out in a different lesson. So this is just a general summary of the, the government in the Roman Republic, right? So again, at the top, you have the councils. One heads the army and one heads the government. And they're going to enforce the laws. And that should sound something like an executive branch, kind of like in the United States, like how we have the president. And then you have the branch that makes laws, the legislative branch. That should sound kind of familiar to what we have. We also have a legislative branch in the United States, and that's our Congress, Right? We have a Senate as well and a House of Representatives. And we adopted that from Rome. Rome had, again, a Senate, again, 300 members. And you're going to really need to know that these 300 members are patricians, right? And then we have the Assembly, uh, which can select consuls and, uh, or tribunes and make laws. And that would be what these uh, plebeians voted on. And then you had like tribal assembly, uh, which elect tribunes and make laws as well. So really, for their legislative branch of government, they had three different sections of the legislature, uh, whereas in our government, we have two. And then they also had a judicial branch, kind of like we have the Supreme Court in the United States. You have the praetors. The praetors were, uh, was a judicial branch in Rome. And they were judges who were chosen for uh, one year by the Centurion Assembly. And they oversaw the courts, right? And they also had the 12 tables, which gave protections to people under the law. And again, you know, those with citizenship, men, landowners, those were the ones who were protected by the 12 tables. And you're going to need to know what the definition of citizenship is and what the purpose of the 12 tables was. Now here you can see is actually the Roman Forum. These are the ruins of the Roman Forum, which you can still go visit today. So obviously these are uh, just partial ruins. It's not completely intact. Uh, however, this was much bigger and grander, right? And we're gonna take some, uh, another look at some more pictures in class of some Roman architecture and in some videos and stuff, we'll see some other pictures. But it's really amazing though, to see something like this in this photo that was created more than 2000 years ago. 
and parts of it are still standing. And to be honest, the effect of the Roman Forum, the effect of what this area once was is still being felt in the world today. It's, it's the basis of de democratic government. Now, people who are citizens, adult male landowners in Rome, they were all required to serve in the army. And the Roman army was made up of a group called, uh, different groups, and the largest of these groups, the largest of these units was called a legion. And this is about 5,000 foot soldiers, infantry, and they were supported by cavalry. Cavalry is uh, are soldiers who are on horseback, or yeah. And this is a this was a wise decision to have them supported by cavalry, so that way they could rout enemies and really take advantage of the flanks, their sides, right? And uh, for use that uh, cavalry to really destroy enemy forces. But each legion, each legion, which is that largest military unit, is broken down into different groups. And those smaller groups are groups of 80 men. And we call those, or they called those a century. And each charge of each century would be a centurion. And he'd be a commander for those 80 men. Now, because of Rome's military organization, they're able to expand in the Italian peninsula uh, pretty rapidly. And this is the real reason throughout the Republic, even throughout the empire, especially, that Rome is able to expand and become so powerful. And it's through the army. So really make sure that you emphasize this, that you understand this is how they expanded, was through conquest. So it's really important. And part of the um, reason why Rome falls is, um, we'll learn a little, bit, a little bit about that later, but it has something to do with their army. And we'll learn about that in their next, in one of our upcoming lessons. You'll see what happens to their army. So and the other way that Rome is going to expand, there's two ways, right? And one's gonna be through conquering so you can just, uh, you know, when we were talking about the army, that's actually going to be through um, the first way. And, you know, the other way they're going to uh, conquer is through uh, trade as well. So it's important to know that the, the Romans, uh, they conquered the Italian peninsula, but they didn't control the entire planet. So they've just controlled the area around Rome itself at, for, for the first like uh, beginnings of the civilization. And so what they're going to do is they're going to go to war with the Etruscans and the Greek city-states because, again, there were great uh, Greek city-states in the south, uh, the polis, and needed colonies to get the resources that they needed to advance and to survive, right? And so uh, Rome, basically, their army defeats both of these groups, both the Etruscans and the Greek city-states. City and by 265 BCE, uh, Rome controls the entire Italian peninsula through conquest. Now, there's a question, you know, how are they going to, um, how are they going to work because, how's this going to work because they could take a hard line, you know, an oppressive approach once they conquer these people, they could have enslaved them, or they could do what other civilizations have done, um, like the Persians, for example, and they could adopt those people through cultural diffusion. So Rome is going to actually treat these new areas justly, and um, they're going to uh, actually give those people, the Etruscans and the citizens of the Greek city-states that they conquer, they're going to give these people Roman citizenship and rights as long as they contribute to the army so they can continue to grow and have conquests. So their military gets larger. They actually get stronger through, through this process, Rome does. And they don't, um, they don't allow 
the kingdoms that they conquer to make any alliances with others. And by doing this, it enables Rome to expand and prosper and actually have a stronger military, which is just crazy to see. So now you can see that the entire Roman Peninsula, when you look at this map, by 272 is going to be under the control of Rome. And you might be thinking, uh, so this is the dark purple right here on this map is what they what they control by 272. And then you might be wondering, well, what about these light purple regions? What happens? How do they get control of those? Um, and we will get to that in uh, upcoming lessons. So the other way, like I was mentioning earlier, that Rome spreads is through trade because Rome's going to have two things that are really important. One of them is wine and the other is olive oil. Now, wine, obviously, because of its alcoholic content, people are going to use it. Olive oil, because of its health benefits, and uh, people need fats. You need to have, you actually need um, to eat fats uh, and oils to survive. And these were luxury items, both wine and olive oil. And they're luxury items that people wanted. So people are obviously going to pay for more for these luxury items. And, you know, the great thing is that Rome is on the Mediterranean Sea. And because it's on the Mediterranean Sea, the Rome, uh, Rome can go out um, and they can trade with France and Spain. And they can go over to the Greek islands. They can go over to into North Africa. Um, the only problem in North Africa is that there is an area, uh, another civilization there, that is another big trade player that is also involved in trade in the Mediterranean. And that is the area of Carthage. Now, you might remember from your previous history classes in middle school that Carthage was established originally by the Phoenicians. And these two groups, the Romans and the Carthaginians, they're going to be rivals for each other because they both want to be the big kid in the backyard, right? So what's going to happen is there's going to be three wars that are going to be fought between Carthage and Rome to find out who's going to be the big kid on the block. Um, and um, these wars, these, these fights, um, are going to be called the Punic Wars, and they're going to be fought between 264 and 146 BCE. So right here you can see. And the first war that takes 23 years, Rome wins, gains a little bit of territory, Right, But what happens in the Second Punic War is there's a general for Carthage. His name is Hannibal, and he is depicted in the, the picture on the left riding and commanding his forces. He's riding the horse there. And his idea, Hannibal's idea, is to take an army, go up, the, uh, up and down the Italian peninsula and just cause, cause havoc. And so what he does is he decides, I'm going to, I'm not going to land in the Italian peninsula. I'm actually going to land in Spain and go through France and actually go through um, the mountain chain, the Alps, that protect the Italian peninsula. So he goes from North Africa up into Spain through France and then crosses the Alps um, into the Italian peninsula from the rest of Europe. And he brings one interesting war machine with him, and that is elephants. You see, elephants provided a couple of things for his army. One was intimidation, an intimidation factor. You know, if you're riding elephants into battle, that's, that's pretty terrible uh, if you see that coming, right? Secondly, it's a huge intimidator factor for cavalry because elephants are obviously going to beat cavalry. Horses are gonna be terrified of these giant elephants coming towards them. And basically what happens is for years, Hannibal marches up and down the Italian peninsula. But the strange thing is he doesn't take Rome because the problem is, um, you know, in order to take it, you need to control it. And he doesn't really have the army uh, to sack uh, and occupy and control Rome. He might be able to attack, but he can't control it. So... To weaken Rome instead, 
of just attacking, he goes and destroys farmland and attacks villages, things like that. And the Romans don't really have the resources to stop him. What eventually happens, though, is the Roman general Scipio, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, Scipio, uh, he decides, you know, we're going to invade Carthage and cause as much havoc there as possible. So that way Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, will be forced to leave the Italian peninsula, come back to Carthage and fight us there. And basically that's what happens. And Scipio defeats Hannibal in 202 BCE. And then there's one more Punic War where Rome completely destroys Carthage. Just, it doesn't just, they don't just sack the city. They don't just, just burn it down, but Carthage is completely gone. It's completely off the map and it doesn't, it never returns to even a shadow of its former glory. So what we've seen here is Rome going from a bunch of villages on some hills, right, to a urban center, the master of the Italian peninsula, to now the master of the Mediterranean world, as you can see on this map. It's very, very interesting stuff. And here again, like I said, this is the map of the Punic Wars. You can see, I just want to point out Hannibal's journey Again, he started down here in Spain, right? And worked his way north up through Spain, through Gaul, what is today France, and then crossed the Alps into the Italian peninsula use, with his elephant army and was marching up and down the Italian peninsula for years, ransacking the place. Um, but he never went to Rome itself and conquered, right? And um, you can see also Scipio down here in this map. He goes from Sicily, crosses to Carthage, um, goes into Carthage, forces Hannibal to come back, and then defeats him there. So we've seen again in this lesson the very foundations of Rome in the Roman Republic. And what we basically see now by the end of the Punic Wars that we just talked about is that Rome is now going to con control this massive territory. So look at this massive territory up Spain, all of Spain, all of Greece, northern Greece, Macedonia, the city-states that we've learned about, and even parts of um, the Balkans up here, and northern Italy, almost to Switzerland up here. They're going to control all of this, this massive amount of territory by 146 BCE, uh, by the end of the Punic Wars. So, and as a result of these wars, now they've taken out the only other rival to their power in the Mediterranean. And what we're going to see in our next lessons is eventually we're going to see Rome decides to do what, what they do next and how their government is going to change and how they'll become an empire. So that's all for today's lesson. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. Um, let me know if you have any questions. And thank you for watching.